Our laws as it pertain to substances are draconian and bizarre. The psychopaths start this way. He was an alcoholic. Because of social media and pornography, PTSD, love addiction, fentanyl and heroin, ridiculous <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a doctor for <laughs> sake. Where the hell you think I learned that? I'm just saying, you go to treatment before you kill people. I am a clinician. I observe things about these chemicals. Let's just deal with what's real. We used to get these calls on Loveline all the time. Educate adolescents and to prevent and to treat. If you have trouble, you can't stop and you want to help stop it, I can help. I got a lot to say. I got a lot more to say. Hey now, welcome. We appreciate y'all being here and watching you on the restream. And of course, we're building a room at Clubhouse where you'll be able to ask questions of our guests in just a minute. Susan, how are you doing? Wonderful. We kind of slipped in here early today. I apologize for the uh, time changes. We um, we screwed up. <laughs> Bottom line is we screwed up. And we thankfully, Dr. Zelenko very kindly adjusted his schedule to speak with us in just a moment. Quick thing about yesterday, uh, I mentioned my crack producer is over at HLN and the producer who gave us our guest yesterday, I said Shana for some weird reason. I was thinking about Leanne Tweeden at the time and then I told that story. Her name is Shana and Shana was one of our great producers at HLN. And of course she pointed it out to me and I-, I She did. <laughs> well, she did just at the time I was going, Susan, did I say Shana? <laughs> so I know, so, I was like, who's Shana? I don't remember, <laughs> so Shana, but Shana I remember. So yeah, so weird. Uh, but then again, that is my my mouth that goes ahead of my brain, uh, particularly since COVID. Uh, <laughs> it's funny. Yeah, blame it on the COVID. Yeah, I wish it were funny, but it's just not. <laughs> so Dr. Zelenko is a Ukrainian-American family physician uh, known for promoting uh, drug combinations, uh, particularly hydroxychloroquine, zinc, az azithromycin. Uh, as part of COVID early treatment. He was nominated for the Presidential Medal of Freeman, a Nobel Freedom, a Nobel Prize, and was recognized as a hero at a U.S. Senate Homeland Security Committee meeting. And of course, like anyone who spoke up during this pandemic, he's had his share of critics as well. We thought it'd be interesting to check back in with Dr. Zelenko. So let's bring him in here. Dr. Zelenko, welcome back. Hey, so nice to see you, Drew. You as well. First and foremost, how is your health? Um, actually, I feel very well. I, um, I had recurrence, uh, again, and it was inoperable. Um, I had radiation and I couldn't tolerate chemo anymore. It gave me heart failure and bone marrow suppression. And so mm. I didn't have too many options. So I, I went to Europe for two months to get, uh, experimental, uh, immunotherapy, which was based on checkpoint inhibitors, but also, um, not typical allopathic means, uh, hyperthermia therapy, whole body mm. focused and then, uh, IL-2 induced. By the way, that's quite an experience to have a 105 fever for four hours. You Does don't need mushrooms. Good. That, Does not sound like, doesn't sound like you fun. Don't need I, mushrooms they used that, to right? do, really uh, <laughs> they used to do that to clear syphilis, right? They used to try to induce uh, hyperthermia and it worked sometimes. Is, is that is why I'm feeling better? Is that what you're saying? So, uh, <laughs> it was to clear the neuros the neurosyphilis got cleared awesome uh but but um to 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 your point um the just so people know the checkpoint inhibitor essentially your your body your cancer has developed ways to hide from their immune system and there are ways to sort of re-expose it to your immune system so your own immune system can attack and wh where are the recurrences if you don't mind me asking there's a pulmonary artery uh, in the pulmonary artery but in a very inoperable well, they told me that I have more than a 50% chance of dying on the table, third open heart procedure. Mm. So I said, I don't, mm. want, I don't, I don't like that. But well, thank and, God. And you'd already had that procedure. Twice, yeah. Twice? So, wow. Oh, my goodness. I have one long little thing. But let me tell you the good news. So, You're amazing. Uh, I don't know. I'm just Zev. But... Um, so I had a follow up after, after that treatment, I had a follow up CT PET and actually showed that the tumor shrunk by a third. And um, mm. more importantly, on the PET scan, that it was quiet. And so I have another, another image in, in the next week, actually. But, uh, you know, I really feel good. I, I feel better than I have in a long time. Tango. Amazing. Then, and if I again, I just feel the need to sort of interpret the, the doctor speak we're getting into. So, what Dr. Zlenko is telling us is that his tumor in his pulmonary artery to the lung that remains, um, which is a wild tumor to begin with, and he's had two surgeries on intra intra arterial sarcomas, 
And this time it's shrunk by a third and it's quiet on PET scan, meaning it may be dead. It may be going to shrink even more. We'll, we will pray for that. Please God. And I do believe that I'm, uh, you know, the heart beats over a hundred thousand times a day. I, I really feel that each of those beats is due to the positive energy and prayers that people have sent in my direction. Cause I know the statistics that should have been dead four years ago. So. Yeah, I mean, this when I first, I know it sounds like you should well, have been. Well, when I first heard about a tumor, I'm like, oh God, oh terrible, oh my goodness, and then he's like, yeah, I'm gonna get taken out. Like, oh God, that sounds terrible too. And then it's like these are really serious operations. And then, as I recall, after the second operation, then you got COVID, right? Yeah. So what happened? Um, I was on very difficult chemo, um, four different drugs, and it threw me, uh, gave me cardiomyopathy, which basically damaged my heart. <sighs> My EF was 35, which is equivalent to someone who had a major heart attack. And my lungs mm -hmm. developed, I got fluid in my lungs, congestive heart failure. So that wasn't fun. Mm. And um, so I, I was in the hospital, they removed the fluid, and I, I went on Entresto, which is a, a, a heart failure medication. And over time, thank God, you know, it actually improved. I'm still on the drug, but my heart function is normal. But oh I my God, that's amazing. That's also amazing. That's incredible. Yeah. And then, uh, but listen, so I was off the chemo because I couldn't tolerate it. And then after like three months, my oncologist said, well, let's try something called Sutent, uh, which is a, like Gleevec. It's a type of, um, how do you say it? It's a tar targeted therapy. It was a custom designed drug, uh, tyrosine yeah. kinase maybe. TKS. But anyway, right. so yeah. that I could tolerate, but then after like a few months, I started feeling really bad. And I went and I got a blood test and my bone marrow su was suppressed. Mm. My white count mm -hmm. was low. Now keep in that mind, happen, I, right? I, I was, I did not restrict myself at all. I have no mask, no gloves, I've seen patients exposed to COVID like crazy. Um, go to my synagogue. I had no, no, I was just taking prophylaxis and I was so good for a long time. But then when my bone marrow got suppressed, I got sick and, and I really got sick in my one lung, yeah. both lobes, left lung. And I ended up in the hospital. My oxygen level was um, 75 on oxygen and mm. I couldn't get up out of bed. They wanted to mm. intubate me, put me on a respirator. I said, I'd rather die this way. Uh, but with the high dose steroids, uh, miraculously, I, I really turned around. And uh, yeah, the steroids do do work; they help anyway. I want to tell you a share experience with you. I really thought that at that visit I'd be leaving in a box, and it was pretty amazing that uh, you know I survived. And um, when I was discharged from the hospital, they, <coughs> they wheeled me down in a wheelchair. And I was waiting. <laughs> I get emotional, so. so. Sure. So uh, I was waiting for my ride, and it was Lenox Hill Hospital, and uh, and I I just felt like the warmth of the sun on my face, and a little breeze. The feeling of ecstasy and pleasure that I experienced at that moment. Um, are you there? I, I'm here because I. I I can. I felt something similar to that when I was sick with COVID too. I that let him that, finish. But please go ahead. Yeah, it, it was just, just a, such a simple experience of the warmth of the sun and just to feel the breeze. When I thought I would be leaving in a box, it was so great mm -hmm. to be alive. Um, it's amazing, actually. So, um. You know, I've dodged a lot of bullets, and it's not like I don't have my medical issues still, but um, I have a very, my attitude is the following, that I don't worry about things that I can't control. Um, I, I'm not, I don't worry how I'm going to die. I worry how I'm going to live. And so that's where, those are the things I can control and, and change and improve. So I use my limited energies in that direction. That's, that's kind of what I was hoping we would get into today because so much else has already been said, but 
I, I wondered how you philosophically, you've just shared with us how you philosophically deal with your illness, but how philosophically have you been thinking? Because you, you tend to be very spiritual and very thoughtful about what's going on. <laughs> what have we been through here in this country? What was this all about? Uh, how, you know, the way you were treated and not treated. Uh, have you, have you, do you have a philosophical sort of thought about this whole experience? I've reverse engineered the worst crime in human history. But it depends on your uh, tolerance about what I'm about to tell you. Um, everything, first of all, whoever's listening to me, please don't believe a word I'm saying. What I mean by that is, <laughs> no, I mean it. Um, blind faith belongs to God. With human beings, you should trust, but definitely verify. And everything that's being said, I, I have sources for what I'm saying. So I've survived two years of intense media abuse <coughs> for a reason. <coughs> because I have evidence for what I say. <coughs> Are I you going to be able to share the evidence? You yeah, of course. be able to tell us the evidence, or yeah, go ahead. <coughs> oh, go ahead. Yeah, of course. I have evidence. You need to get some water. Okay. Yeah. Um, go ahead. Yeah, we're doing very, very well. Post COVID. Yeah, yeah, it is could be well, he only has one lung too. And and that lung's got a tumor in it. Yeah. So good time good times. And uh people are sending Dr. Blanco their blessings, which is what I know he is uh, appreciative of. That he um he just said earlier, I don't know if you noticed that the he feels though the prayers that people are doing have made a difference. Also, we're on Rumble today if anybody loses a feed in midstream. We had a little glitch on Facebook because already no, there was there was something to do with that I had to clear first. I don't think it has anything to do with this actually. Okay. All right. So what I'm going to do is email or text your wife a PowerPoint that has all the evidence, and then as I talk, or at a later date, you could uh, share it with everyone. Okay. So all right, we'll do our best. Okay, I'm just going to go straight into. COVID-19 yeah. is a weapon of mass murder. There's nothing natural about it. We have 20 years of patent evidence and 20 years of peer-reviewed published paper evidence that in detail chronicles how this weapon of mass murder was constructed. And I'm going to start I'm giving you the details right now. 1998, Ralph Barrick, Dr. Ralph Barrick, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, funded by the NIH, began research on something called cross-species transmissibility, which basically meant to take a virus from one species and make it infectious to another species. Okay, published a paper on it in 1998. In 1999, he perfected the technique, published a paper on it. Again, funded by the NIH. In 2002, Dr. Ralph Barrett got a patent, United States patent, which was his research was funded by the NIH, which described how to take a coronavirus and modify its lethality to human lung tissue. I have the patent. Then there was a lull, because gain of function research, which is a cynical term, you know what gain of function is? research sounds like. Someone had a stroke, they couldn't walk. Yeah. They did physical therapy, they regained their function to walk, gain of function. In reality, what gain of function research here means is to take a benign animal virus and make it infectious to human beings and destructive to human lung tissue and cause blood clots. And that research was made illegal and so it was outsourced to China. In 2015, Dr. Ralph Barrick and Dr. Zhang Li in Wuhan published a paper funded by the NIH. I don't know if you see a pattern here, um, where they figured out how to take a bad coronavirus and make it infectious to human beings. I have that paper. So the bomb was completed. The two steps of the bomb. One, and by the way, they could have completed it 
much earlier. But there's a reason why they didn't. I'll tell you in a minute. The, 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 the component of taking a bad coronavirus and infect human beings, it's one, but so what? They're not lethal. And the, but modify that virus in such a way that it becomes disruptive to human. The, pay, the, the payload becomes lethal. And so Can I ask? both of those steps were done and combined. And is, a is, the furin, is the furin cleavage site part of that modification? Yes. Yes. Yeah. ACE2, furin. They, they, basically, that's how they figured out how to get into the uh, animal virus into a human cell. Mm -hmm. Now, he, here is the, really disturbing, is the really disturbing part. In um, March of 2020, when I basically was in the epicenter of the largest a COVID outbreak in America with no treatment, um, I saw a video, MedCram episode 34, Dr. Schultz. And in that video, Dr. Schultz described uh, the use of zinc ionophores with zinc, specifically hydroxychloroquine, um, in, the, in delivering large amounts of zinc into the cell to inhibit an enzyme called RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, which was essential for uh, RNA, some RNA viruses to replicate. In other words, zinc stopped the virus from spreading. But zinc could not get into the cell, so it needed another compound to facilitate its entry into the cell. So it's like a gun and a bullet. Zinc is the bullet, and in this case, hydroxychloroquine was the gun that delivered the bullet. Now, that paper was published in 2010. The one thing I didn't realize until three months ago, that it was, it was offered by Dr. Ralph Barrett. Same guy. Yeah, I have this. I'm going to give you. I'm going to give it to you. You can't deny it. this. Is I, I wouldn't go on national tele, uh, program and just say this. And so, just to process what I just said, the same. By the way, funded by the NIH, the same funding and the same person was involved in every stage of development of this weapon of mass murder, and also developed an antidote to defuse this which when doctors like myself stumbled across that information in a very organized and choreographed fashion, that information was suppressed, marginalized, vilified. Any doctor who dared to speak about its use was the platform. So it, it was, and it was, and the media was all in, in a very unified fashion doing the same thing. So, and why? The, this information was paid for the, and the research was paid by the American taxpayer, published in 2010. It belonged to us. It's not like they didn't know. Okay, so that, that's the first phase of my research. What, what, where, where, where is that, the, the researcher, where is he? Is he around now? Why didn't he speak yeah. up during all this? That's a good question. No one's dared to talk to him. He, his name is Dr. Ralph Barrick. He is at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He's a brilliant guy. I wish he would go on the media in the last two years and talk about his research. Well, or at least just, you know, get his position, his opinion on, on the papers, or does he have some other publications that he'd like us to look at or whatever? I, I, you know, where's where he at with this? Of course we have to hear from quiet. Him. Yeah, I, I'm, yeah. I'm inviting him. I, of course, I want to hear from him. Mm. All right. Then, look, I got red-pilled when Cuomo, March 27th, 2020, issued an executive order blocking pharmacies in New York from dispensing hydroxychloroquine. Now, that was a direct attack on me and my practice. Why? Because I was the only one doing it. And so just imagine from my perspective, I have, I'm in the middle of a inferno of disease. With God's grace, I, I figured out something, but by the way, which has now been validated to reduce hospitalization and death with multiple peer reviewed studies by 85%. Meaning if you risk stratify patients, take out the high risk patients, you treat them early with an antiviral, anti-inflammatory, approach, you virtually eliminate 
the need for hospitalization. And it's not me saying it. By the way, it doesn't have to be hydroxychloroquine. It could be ivermectin. It could be um, EGCG, quercetin, steroids, blood thinners, monoclonal antibodies, Luvox, colchicine. We have many, many tools in our armament. And I found the most effective treatment is custom tailored to each individual patient. Because it depends on their history, depends on their presentation, depends on their preferences. And, and then you kind of put together a treatment approach that is unique to that patient. That's what I found the best kind of outcomes. Yeah. But um, yeah, so when Cuomo blocked access, I couldn't understand it. And, and then my patients started dying again because they couldn't get the medication. Anyway, so I did research again, and on the NIH server, I found a substitute for hydroxychloroquine, which is called quercetin. I remember being on your show, saying it, and you actually wrote it down and looked it up. I, I remember mm -hmm. that. Uh, and mm -hmm. what, what it and was. I, then I took it. Everybody oh. took it. Yeah, we all took it back then. Yeah. With the zinc. And here's something funny. Yeah. I, I, and the D. I did five. The C. I did five interviews in Israel about quercetin. It sold out inside the whole entire country. Mm. Anyway, so what quercetin was, it was a, it's a bioflavonoid or a plant derivative. It's found in onions and apple peels. But more importantly, it was over the counter. So I remember, I'm getting goosebumps. I remember like leaning back and saying, you know, I just found the cure to tyranny. Because there are two reasons why people died from COVID. One was delaying treatment. And two was governmental tyranny by blocking access to life-saving information, life-saving medication. Um, well, what, and so what, what, I kind of agree with it. I'm wondering what, what happened to our profession. It was such a weird moment where we're accustomed to doing the best we can for our patients, given whatever is available to us at the moment, doing the least harm, right? Do no harm. And I'll tell you what try to come up with some improvisation. But it was so weird that academic medicine, our peers froze in place and were unwilling to do anything. It was a very weird moment. What, what do you think that was? Well, it's very simple. In the last 20 years, the solo practitioner or smaller group practices were all acquired by larger institutions. Doctors lost yeah, that's their what economy. I thought too. Yeah, that's what I and thought. So literally, literally we went from decentralization to centralization. That's sort of how I think of it. We use it used to be then, decentralized to the the best possibly trained individual practitioner and a informed motivated patient, and now we've taken all the decision making, moved it back up to the bureaucracy, and people are afraid to do anything outside of the quote clinical pathways. And and the pathways are set by bureaucrats or people higher yep. up, and if doctors yep. deviated from them, they were fired yep. or sanctioned or I think vilified. that's right. I think that's right. I didn't know that was happening until this outbreak, and I was I was stunned to see the behavior change. It was like what, you don't. You, I, I never practiced in a time when people looked at patients and said, uh, "Go home, come back when you're sick." You know, it's just the craziest thing in the world to me to, that they would say, uh, "Sorry, there's things we could do, but we're not allowed to. Just go home, go home, and when your you know, when your PO two drops below eighty, let us know," which was already too late. That's right. Um, it's tragic. There's so much unnecessary death that we witnessed. Um, but anyway, so so I found the substitute, and I, I just open sourced all that information, and people started doing better again. Because now I could say, Drew, go to the vitamin shop, pick it up at the prescription or whatever, and people were getting care yeah. in the right time frame. And then all the academic malfeasance and fraud started. I'll go through three studies that are very important that kind of set the paradigm for everything. There was a study that was, came out in April uh, from the VA in Virginia. That study said, showed that hydroxychloroquine kills people. The only problem with that study was it was done on patients in the ICU on respirators for at least 17 days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember okay. that study. Is it logical? To take, I don't. I I agree. Maybe it did kill people in that setting, but I was never advocating for its use there. I was advocating 
yeah. day two or three of the yeah. illness. You can't make that extrapolation. The second study, but, but to be fair to them, to be fair to them, before you go to the second one, that that's typical of how we do. Oh, look at that, Susan. Take a look. Oh, oh, <laughs> it's a golden doodle. Look at that guy. That is cute. Male or female? Oh boy, his name is Mishka, which means in in Russian teddy bear. Mishka. Oh, wow. oh. He's so funny, um, but but to, to to put a brighter light on that first study, that's sort of typical of how research is done with so-called new medication. Usually, you take a medication to study it, and you first study it in hopeless cases, essentially. Like you know, if somebody uh, you know has tried everything, tr you know, sort of uh, at the standard of care for a cancer, and they want to try this new medication. At the very end of the line, that's when they'll try it. That's sort of how neo, that's how oncology research done is in any, any event. This was a medicine that was being used at the time around the world, and it was sort of weird to, for them to treat it as though it was some unknown medicine that had to be used at the, the last stages. That was sort of a weird choice, but we do that. Okay, so that was the first study. The second study was the recovery trial uh, sponsored by Oxford University. Now, this one was a good one. 27% uh, patient, of patients that took hydroxychloroquine died in that study. There's one little detail. They used 2,400 milligrams a day of hydroxychloroquine when the recommended dose was 400. In other words, mm. they used six times the recommended dose. Or in other words, they proved mm. that if you poison people with homicidal and lethal dosing, they die. Wild. Okay. And then the and third? The Oh, this was the best. Um, the Lancet publishes a study, also the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, it's a meta-analysis of 96,000 patients that hydroxychloroquine kills patients. Immediately, the World ho Homicide Organization um, issues a global moratorium on research and use of hydroxychloroquine. And the only problem with that study was that it was fraud. And in the biggest scandal in the history of medicine and peer-reviewed science, the Lancet and the New England Journal of Medicine had to retract that study by Surgisphere for fraud. That study was worth less than used toilet paper. Now, and here Surgisphere really was, what, what was their, they were like a vote, what were they, a political organization? I forget what their original, they don't do medical research, Surgisphere. Why, why they got involved was weird too, right? I don't know, but I know their executive assistant was a porn star. <laughs> That's right, I remember that. That's right, I forgot that. Woo. Now, now, now it gets really interesting. So, when President Trump said, that he wants hydroxychloroquine made available to every American. That task was given to Azar, Secretary Azar, who gave it over to Rick Bright. Uh, he was the head of BARDA, which is a division of the Health and Human Services. They were involved in uh, biomedical research, bioweapons medical research, and vaccine development, which is interesting to capabilities. Anyway, um, and so this is on video. There's a documentary called totally under control, which I was in. And in the segment before that, Rick Bright, in his own words, brags what he did. He said the following. He and his team did not agree with President Trump's order to make hydroxychloroquine available to every American. And so they figured out a very clever way. They were supposed to use the right to try legislation championed by uh, Senator Ron Johnson to open the national stockpile of hydroxychloroquine, which that's another question. Why would the government of the United States stockpile hydroxychloroquine if it's so dangerous? And they were supposed to open it up and make it available to every American. What they did was issue an emergency use authorization only for hospitalized patients, if you remember that. Mm. And yeah. what that did, uh, it sent a message to every single doctor in this country, myself included, that it seemed that you could only use it in the hospital setting. But in reality, all it did was open up the national stockpile of hydroxychloroquine to hospitals. 
but it did not restrict doctors like you and me to use it in the outpatient setting. But the net effect was the following, that all the hospital institutions and all the larger employers of doctors uh, took it to mean that way and issued uh, restrictions to their doctors not to use it in the outpatient setting. So effectively, that emergency use authorization destroyed any possibility, practically speaking, of using hydroxychloroquine in the outpatient setting, which was the exact opposite of what President Trump had ordered. That's all documented. Mm -hmm. By the way, in the words of the, of the perpetrators. Now it gets even better. And so, okay, <laughs> it keeps going. All right, I'm ready. In February, uh, in, the Lancet paper was retracted, was published and retracted in May of 2020. In June of 2020, the FDA revokes the emergency use authorization for hydroxychloroquine, even for the hospital setting. Mm. And if you look at their document for the rationale, look at uh, footnote 32. It actually tells you, they quote the Lancet paper that had been retracted for fraud. Right. After its retraction as the basis for revoking the emergency use authorization for hydroxychloroquine. What, what do you think this all was that had everyone going in this particular direction uh, around a medication? You could argue whether it was effective, but it was a medicine you and I have used for 35 years at least, um, and that's used in Africa every single day. Why did the, and this is the Surgisphere scandal was part of that. Why the rush, the breathless rush to go this one direction? What was that? That was motivated by something. It was motivated reasoning at, at, at best. What, well, how do we understand that? That's the stuff uh, in the early part of this pandemic that I found so mysterious. You can't and why we're not truth. looking at that. Well, you would tell me in a second. I'll, I'll, maybe not. But, but why, and then the, the, my other question is, why are we not really examining all this carefully so we don't do stuff like this again? Why isn't somebody, at least on a, a social psychology level, looking at these things and going, what happened? What was that? What went wrong? That, that, Let we'll me just start with your are. hypothesis. Okay. It's not a hypothesis. People, people, it's real. people will hear you speak. Trust me. It's not <laughs> Closing the door is not going to keep your word from getting out. <laughs> no, no. You're on a stream, just to be, just to be, so we're clear. And by the way, I'm reading the Wikipedia and Surgisphere. It, it's crazy when you really read about it. It's super crazy. So, so listen. If you look at um, Australia and in, in the province of New South Wales, as of today, any doctor that prescribes hydroxychloroquine or ivermectin to that matter, in the treatment of COVID-19, goes to jail for six months. And the government tells you why. It says it because it encourages vaccine hesitancy. Oh. So let me translate that. I want, to, I want to translate that for you. They're not denying it works. On the contrary, it works. And what happens is doctors that help their patients in the right way they get better. When patients get better, they say, well, why do I need to take the vaccine? And they probably encourage other people, their family, not to take it. Well, but, but even the, there, is, there is plenty of room in that construct for public health officials to talk about hybrid immunity and duration of natural immunity and to still be encouraging the vaccine if that's what they wish to do. I mean, the, the having had natural infection does not change the diathesis that much changes it the patient may change their ideas a little bit but the public health position could still be no 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 we really want you to get hybrid immunity to be sure we push this thing down as far as possible reasonable they can do that but to weirdly distort i know that's the weird part that's the craziness to me that's not so crazy that's the excess uh, I'm, I'm, uh, the excess well, let me, let me ask you this. Um, the, what's, for some reason to me, um, the whole world situation sort of goes this way in a weird way. I mean, what was going on in Canada seemed bizarre to me. And now what's going on in the Ukraine is bizarre to me. 
do, do you have a way of understanding all these things? I do. But it'll take a little I'm listening. It's a very complex puzzle. And I'm not going to tell you what the puzzle looks like. I'm going to give you the puzzle pieces and let you figure it out. So there are there's psychological warfare. And it's well known that if you induce a chronic anxiety or fear state and you isolate someone from the people they love and you dehumanize them by putting a face taper on, what's going to happen for the majority of people is they're going to psychologically decompensate. And when they, you can call it mass psychosis. When people psychologically decompensate, they get damaged, they get hurt, they become vulnerable, gullible, and very easy to manipulate. And the whole purpose of this artificially made weapon of, really it's a weapon of fear, let's say, was to create global fear. And then to use that global fear to manipulate the behavior of large numbers of human beings. And I'm going to have to start building. Everything I'm saying is verifiable. So um, I'm going to start building the puzzle for you. In 2010, Bill Gates had a TED lecture. Anyone could just Google um, TED Gates 2010 population control. Bill Gates gave a presentation and said the following. Most people know about this. He said that the biggest threat to the planet is global warming. The biggest cause of global warming is carbon emissions. The biggest source of carbon emissions is human beings. And therefore, we need to reduce the world population by 10 to 15 percent. That's a billion people, more than. And how are we going to do that is through the use of vaccines. Okay. The, the same Bill Gates in 2020 said 7 billion people must be vaccinated. Also on video, it's not me saying. So I'm going to ask a rhetorical question. Uh, I don't need an answer. Just why would I take a vaccine for my health that is being financed and advocated for by someone who wants to reduce the world population? Okay. In 2016, Klaus Schwab from the World Economic Forum gave a very bizarre interview on a French media platform. I have the interview. It's with subtitles. And he said... And I quote, that within 10 years, by 2026, every single human being will be tagged with a digital identifier. What does that mean? I forget about the purpose of it, but how do you get 7 billion people to willingly volunteer to get tagged with a digital identifier? I don't know. No one understood it at the time. Okay. Now, here's some facts. You look at the World Economic Forum, which is really, they have schooled most of the world leaders right now. For example, Trudeau, Macron, Ardern, Morrison, and many other world leaders. Uh, what, what was her name? Angela Merkel. Uh, even Bill Gates himself was a graduate of, of that school. So it's not like they're without influence, the World Economic Forum. And if you look at their agenda and their website, they're right up, it's right up there. The first two tax uh, goals the 2030 agenda, which is now the 2030 UN agenda, is that number one, America will no longer be a superpower. Number two, a few nations will govern the world globally. Verified? Take a look. So my question is, how do you take the world's most powerful economy and military in human history, and in a matter of a few years, remove its superpower status? Well, I have a way. How about this? You shut down the economy and perpetrate the biggest theft of middle class wealth in history. What do I mean? Well, over a million small businesses closed. And, and the larger corporations picked up their market share and the valuation sky, skyrocketed. Why? Because it was very dangerous to go to the local uh, grocery store, but it was safe to go to Walmart. It was very dangerous to buy a hammer at the local hardware store, but it was safe to go to Home Depot. Number two, you drive up inflation to such a rate 
and devalue the American dollar, that last week Saudi Arabia announced that it's going to shift its reliance on the United States dollar or petrodollars and uh, move towards the digital yuan, which is China's uh, new cryptocurrency. Number three, a national debt of over $30 trillion. But that, okay, we can, you know, we kind of could manage. But what's going to tip the scale? Yeah. Is the <laughs> we don't know. We don't know if we'll be able to handle it or not. That's well, what's interesting. Well, we're not going to manage, but there's a reason. In 2026, according to congressional data, Medicare will become insolvent. We'll begin to go bankrupt. Mm -hmm. Now, if you remember 2008, the housing crisis, that globalized within a week. What happened in America just went global. And most likely the same thing is going to happen when the Medicare system begins to fall and our markets begin to uh, become unstable. You know, they're saying never let a good crisis go to waste. And so, wait a minute, 2026, one second. Isn't that when Klaus Schwab said, according to his vision, that uh, that'll be the year that 7 billion people are tagged with a digital identifier. Okay, now I have to give you two very important patents uh, before, and one of them, you're gonna look at me like I'm nuts, but I challenge you, Drew, to read it and then debate me because I've challenged okay. everyone and no one has dared to come and even um, disagree with my analysis or interpretation. The only people that have made noise called me a conspiracy theorist. And when I talked to them, I saw that they didn't read the patent. It's a United States patent, which I have the number, which I'll forward to you. Um, actually, I can do it probably now. Um, that describes what's in these vaccines already. It's 50 pages, very complex um, nanotechnology engineering. And it describes the following. These vaccines contain, on a nanoscale, the capability to measure biometric data. Heart rate, respiratory rate, and temperature. And more importantly, it has the infrastructure in, on the nanoscale to transmit that information with your location to a third party. Okay, there's a patent. It describes it. I didn't come up with it. Uh, United States patent published August approved August 31st, 2021. Number two, there's another patent. This one I remember by heart. It's owned by Microsoft. It's an international patent. The number is WO2020-060606. And that patent describes the linkage of biometric data transmission to cryptocurrency. I'll give you the patent also. I know you're smart and I know you don't believe you verify everything. So I really do, I beg you to please review it. I want to read it. I, I'm interested yeah. in reading it. Now, to, to understand what's really going on, let's take a look at China. The CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, uh, controls the central bank in China. The central bank in China just issued a digital currency, digital yuan, I mentioned it earlier. Then what they did was they made illegal all other cryptos. So now the only way to transact financially in China is to use a, a government controlled system. Then what they did, this is happening already, it's, it's in place. They um, connected the social credit score system that they have to, to the cryptocurrency system. And so what that means is the following. Uh, you don't need a gulag anymore to put a bullet into someone's head. If you don't like or you view them as a threat, all you need to do really is shut off their ability to transact, to buy food for their family. So that's a very useful, uh, efficient control mechanism. What's happened in China is a dry run for what's going to happen globally, globally in the vision of the world economic forum. The operative word here is economic because there's already the foundation being laid for a global cryptocurrency. Now, in 2026, when the Medicare collapses, there's gonna be a tremendous amount of financial turbulence. That's gonna be used as a catalyst 
to tra transition the world economies to a one world global cryptocurrency controlled by a few global powers. And here's the kicker. In order to participate in that global cryptocurrency, you will have to be a transmitter of biometric data. So let me play out a scenario for you. Um, you need to buy bread, you go online, your local store, you order bread, you need to pay for it. So forget about Apple Pay, credit cards, or fiat currency money, paper money. All you need to do is scan your hand on a sensor. Your biometrics are transmitted. Uh, probably a few minutes later, a drone delivers your bread. It's kind of cool. Except, mm -hmm. what if I don't want to be a transmitter of biometric data? What if I don't want my location known 24-7? What if I don't want my inner temperament, which we can figure out by measuring biometrics, known to whoever? Well, then I'll be excluded from a system of uh, cryptocurrency transactions. I'm sure there'll be a black market, but that's not the point. Uh, what if the government doesn't like me? And I, I know they don't. You know what they're going to do? They're going to restrict or, or uh, shut off my ability to do transactions. It's a control mechanism. And let's look. Um, and I have all this evidence. And so it's a puzzle piece that I thought I needed to show you. But let's look at the population control component. Um, in, 20, in October 2020, FDA had an internal presentation to its scientists. No. Uh, and on slide 16 in that presentation, it wasn't meant to be uh, released, but it got leaked. There's a slide that shows all the side effects that they were expecting with these vaccines. Now, that's two months prior to the release of the rollout. So what, the FDA has prophetic powers? And now we have a year of data, a little bit more, 15 months of data. And what does that data show? Both the Eurovigilance database and the VAERS database, um, that there's a 100% correlation with what the prophetic FDA said would happen in terms of side effects to actually what human beings experienced and reported to these systems, both the European system and the American system. So there's a term for that, when you have 100% correlation. It's called premeditated first-degree murder, crimes against humanity and genocide. And, how, how, and let's look what these vaccines do. FDA said it was going to do it. Well, uh, there's a percentage of people that die relatively soon after being vaccinated, usually due, due to blood clot-induced heart attacks or strokes. There's a percentage of people, young adults, young males, get myocarditis. Uh, miscarriage rates have jumped in the first trimester significantly. Um, that's even according to the Department of Defense data that just got released. They said by 300%. And then there is a huge spike of these weird cancers that we used to not see, especially in young adults. There's a spike in autoimmune diseases. There's ovarian and testicular dysfunction. By the way, there was a biodistribution study leaked, a Pfizer study from Japan. And the lie that we were told was when you get the inoculation, it stays at the site of the shot. What that study showed is that it actually goes to every organ system. And the number one organ system that it uh, gathers in is the ovaries. So, and it causes infertility, by the way. That's even according to the FDA's uh, own predictions. So it's actually a very effective tool for population control. Some people die right away. Some people's li mo lifespans will be decreased because of chronic illness, cancer, and autoimmune disease. Uh, it causes miscarriages and causes infertility. It's amazing, actually, as a weapon to control the population. Could that be why Bill Gates was so adamant about people taking it. The one thing it, it, it doesn't do is protect you from COVID-19. Look at the Israeli data. Israel is the most humanized country in the world, especially from the perspective of four, three shots, and probably two, two shots as well. And according to Israeli funeral directors, which was just published last month, 
in a, in a Israeli newspaper called Haaretz. They're saying that they're seeing a 10x increase in death, so much so that they can't give everyone a proper burial, and also mostly young people. And so the question is, why are they dying? So the official government narrative, it's Omicron. Oh, really? And why isn't anyone else dying from Omicron? You know, even in South Africa, when it started, um, doctors were able to manage it. Now, it's true that Omicron is, is much more infectious, even than measles. But we found that it only affects the upper airway. It doesn't, in most cases, it doesn't cause the damage to the lungs that we saw with the original um, COVID strains. So most people have a bad cold or a flu, but they get over it. So the question is, why are Israelis dying from it? And they are. Well, there's another possibility. And especially the ones that had multiple shots. So what if I tell you I have dozens of peer-reviewed papers that document how these vaccines damage the innate immune system? They suppress T cell function, natural killer cell function, and actually they suppress tumor suppressor genes. So well, I, I know, yeah, I know. Thank you for turning my mic back on, Susan. Um, I know that um, people are concerned about that. People have been looking at that stuff. So more data will be revealed. It is it, it, w take me to the where you're going with this? Where, what's the what? Where are you taking us? So everything I just said fills into comparison to what really is going on. If you listen to the words of the people that have organized this, they say the following. These vaccines change who you are. That's what Bill Gates said, and that's what uh, Klaus Schwab said. What does that mean? And they explain. Through gene editing. What? So it turns out that mRNA is a wonderful platform to deliver CRISPR-Cas9 technology. Look it up, you'll see tons of papers on it. What that means is the following to the public. When the human genome was, was uh, sequenced, we figured out much of which genes correlate to what traits and uh, what functions. And then there was developed a technology called CRISPR-Cas9, which allows for gene editing, which allows for a human being to um, splice out um, a segment of a genetic code of a person and splice in at will another segment. Now, it may have good medical applications, let's say, such, such as Huntington's disease. It's a, it's a terminal disease and there's no treatment for it. But we can, in theory, c cut out that defective gene and splice in a healthy gene. But it also could be used in not so nice ways. For example, everyone has tumor suppressor genes. What if I splice into one of those and, and disrupt it? Well, I've just taken off the brakes for cancer. So well, how, how do you get the reverse transcriptase to get the RNA to turn into DNA? Um, that's a question that I ask. We don't have that in ourselves. Been, yeah. I know. By the way, you know how viruses, they come into your cells with the code for the enzymes that they need to replicate. So RNA-dependent yeah. RNA polymerase is part of the gen genome of viruses. The, the virus itself. Um, I asked that yeah. question yeah. as well. And, but there is evidence that uh, within six hours of injection of mRNA into a person, that there is already integration into the DNA of the person. So there must be hmm. a reverse transcriptase component here. And the question is, where does it come from? My hypothesis, I have no proof for it, is actually encoded in the genetic code of the vaccine that is being injected. But it's hmm. coming, it's being delivered with it. Now, so I summarize the hmm. following. I know this is um, it's a little, I'm pushing consciousness awareness here. And I know the majority of people can't process this and most likely will disregard what I said or call me something like crazy, but that's okay. Uh, I've been called crazy for the last two years and everything that I've said has actually been unfortunately proven right. And so 
there's a population control component to this. There's a surveillance uh, and slavery, like literally control and slavery, slavery mechanism in it. And there's a gene editing component to that. And then I want you to learn about someone. His name is Yuval Noah Harari. Yuval Noah Harari. He's one of the most dangerous people on the planet. He's from. I actually Israel. agree with you. I've shared the. I've shared the. I've shared the podium with him before. His field. His. Uh, well, he was pushing on addiction, if I remember. I'm making sure it's that guy. Um, was uh, or is this the guy that wrote uh, *Sapiens*? Yeah. He wrote yes, *Sapiens*. Oh, a different guy. I think a different guy. Uh, yeah, he he guy. is a professor at Hebrew University in Jerusalem, and he wrote a bunch of books. Obama on CNN called him his favorite author. He has influenced, um, he's called a prophet by Klaus Schwab, Zuckerberg, Gates, someone else. And he speaks at the World Economic Forum every year. And just to give you some tidbits of the things he says is the following. Humans are, ha are hackable animals. And if you could hack into an animal, you could re-engineer that animal. But not with intelligent design, he says. But not with some god above the clouds intelligent design, but by human intelligent design. There's no such thing as soul. There's no such thing as free will. So then he says, we're entering a new era. This COVID-19 crisis will be remembered as the transition to 24-7 surveillance uh, through the implantation under your skin of biometric sensors. Then he said, this is unbelievable, what the previous tyrants and despots like the Gestapo and the Nazis and, and Stalin wanted to do, a few corporations and governments are now able to um, actualize. And in the audience, you see Biden and Klaus Schwab and all these generous <laughs> clap like this. I'll send you all of it. You just have to look at it with an open okay. mind. All right. Well, um, let's step back from that and tell me why that is so. Um, I'm trying to think of a good word. Um, you use the word degenerate, but why it's such a violation of your basic philosophical principles. In other words, I, I feel like it's not just about for you being controlled or not controlled. You mentioned a couple of things such as free will and soul. I, I'm guessing this has a deeper concern for you. And I'm wondering if you could express that. Because, because, because even if it's true or not true, there's a philosophical issue here that people rarely talk about which is sort of the direction we're going. Uh, and I'm suspicious, and you've, you've, at the beginning of this conversation, you talked about how your, your, how prayers have been helpful for you, how your spiritual connection was so meaningful to you, how the joy of being alive was so deeply meaningful to you. How is this a violation? If, forget the truth or untruth of it. How it, uh, this direction is such a violation for you. So there's a few axioms. If you remember, whenever you're in college, especially in science classes, you'd come in, they'd give you a few axioms in the beginning. And they'll say, well, upon these principles, we're going to derive theories. And uh, they don't really prove the axioms, but they use them as building blocks. And then the theories work, so we assume they're true. Um, I'm going to give you a few axioms. God exists. He's good. And he makes us every instant in time, so we're never alone. He gives us two unique gifts that are uniquely his, which is consciousness and free will. And our, we're given a finite number of years to live. And during those finite number of years, we can choose to serve the Creator or not. And we can also choose to connect to the infinite and the eternal um, through the choices that we make. So being able to choose is a 
godly gift that is not meant to be taken away by any other individual. And it sounds like, I, I get that, and it sounds like embedded in some of those concerns is an injunction against, um, well, an injunction to pay attention to humility. Because to have the kind of grandiose sense of uh, self-importance uh, above all, uber alice, I'm, I'm guessing that you would argue that humility is something that's that's sort of missing in all this. Well, actually, what, what Harari said was, we have now the power to become God. Look, what, what I'm seeing is the following. I'm, I'm seeing... That, that always goes well when humans do, do things like that. You know, Dostoevsky and Nietzsche both predicted the carnage of the 20th century. And for the same reason. Mm -hmm. They saw during their lifetimes millennia of moral values. Good or bad, but they were built on uh, experience and some religious principles thrown out, and then the attempt was made to replace those moral values with rationally derived uh, hum human construct. They said <laughs> the arrogance of that statement to take two years, I mean, 2,000 years of uh, evolution of, of human civility or society, and to think that in one or two generations, you can reconstruct it through the use of re reason and human logic, they predicted that that's going to lead to the absolute moral uh, destruction and of the foundation of society, and will lead to the mass murder of hundreds of millions of people. And and yet, in our so, lifetime, I feel like we've I feel like we've seen two waves of humans stepping up and going, ah, we figured it out. I remember in the sixties and seventies, uh, everything that came before is meaningless, and we've now figured it out. And uh, I thought we learned that in one generation. Uh, I, I guess you're right. In Russia, it, it came a hundred years ago. Same kind of came same kind of nonsense, which is we have now figured out the truth, and everything that came before is uh, adulterated and and evil. And on we go. And whenever I hear those, I, obviously I'm being a little, little uh, hyperbolic in how I ex express it. But whenever I hear things like that, I, I shudder, and I feel like we're in, within. Or, you know, what has it been, 40, 50 years, we're in another wave of that kind of thinking right now. You know, what they call the new world order is a rebranding of the oldest world order of idolatry, paganism, and child sacrifice. These aren't evolved thinkers. These are devolved pagans who worship themselves. And by the way, the most interesting thing is they don't believe in God and they don't believe in the afterlife. So they don't want to die. They have a problem though. We live in a body that has a limited lifespan. So what they're actively working on, if you listen to people like Ray Kurzweil and this Harari guy, have actually spent the last 30 years working on a platform, <coughs> a hybrid platform of inorganic and organic construct, a humanoid, that will, with AI, where they believe they can download human consciousness. This is yeah. um, no. literally what they're working on. And mm. so then they found eternal life, they believe, because you can have a series of bodies forever. You can get a new, newer model and it'll just be downloaded. That's why people like Walt Disney had themselves frozen. I, I, I like the idea the better of... Uh... I, I liked being John Malkovich's uh, construct of how that would work better than I like this uh, inorganic, organic wedding. Um, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's a lot to sort of uh, interesting stuff to kind of think about. And it, and it violates some of the basic um, sensibilities that I think you have. And I, and I want to maybe dig into Dostoevsky a little bit further. But first, I want to ask you as a Ukrainian how do you feel about what's going on over there? Do you have any connections? Are you okay? Is what, what's what's all going on with that? Well, actually, I was born in Kiev. Um, I have uh, acquaintances, some family 
uh, and actually in both places. And it's a very interesting, yeah, it's a very interesting situation. First of all, my observation is that Putin had cured COVID because overnight, two years of unrelenting media coverage about COVID, 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 COVID. It just stopped overnight. (laughs) Stopped overnight. (laughs) Whether you cured it or not, it went away. Out she went away also. And all we hear in a global choreographed way is Russia, Putin bad, Ukraine good. So the way I, I in general, figure out what true is, truth is, I listen to CNN and I just believe the opposite. <laughs> and so, and I, listen, I know Putin is not uh, a boy scout. Uh, and oh, by the way, uh, disclaimer, my name is Vladimir Zelenko. The president of Ukraine is Vladimir Zelensky. We're not the same person. Stop emailing me or sending me uh, bad messages. I did not start anything. I'm not joking. <laughs> so, terrible. look, I really think, you know who the culprit here is? It's America. Why, why do I say that? Well, they've encouraged uh, NATO to recruit the Ukraine. And then when you recruit the Ukraine, you move NATO forces closer to the Russian border. It's really analogous to the Cuban Missile Crisis. <coughs> yeah. So they, they poked the Russian bear. And yeah. how about putting yeah. 17 bioweapons labs in the Ukraine? Yeah, more to be revealed on that. I'm I'm anxious. Yeah, I'm anxious to hear what that is all about and what's going on there. Uh, let me let me. I'm so, going to interrupt you real quick if you don't, if you don't mind. Hold that thought. I got to take a little break here, very very quick. I also have some people that want to ask you some questions. I want to get to that. So give me just two minutes here, and we'll be right right back. And I know you've been very kind and with your time, and I'm going to try to be respectful of getting you out of here very quickly. Dr. Vladimir Zelenko will be right back after this. Since the beginning of the pandemic, nearly one in five Americans has reported consuming an unhealthy amount of alcohol. Could be you, but only 10% of them are actually getting the help they need. Reframe is a neuroscience-based smartphone app that helps users cut back or quit drinking alcohol altogether. Using evidence-based tools, techniques, and content, Reframe guides users through a personalized program to help them reach their goals. Comprised of daily tasks, a comprehensive toolkit, a community forum, and accountability guides, Reframe is a modern, accessible, and affordable resource that can help anyone looking to reevaluate their relationship with alcohol. Reframe is backed by Harvard University and Emory University Schools of Medicine, and it is ranked the number one alcohol reduction smartphone app worldwide with over 350,000 downloads. With Reframe, there's no stigma, just science, no labels, just support. To learn more, go to joinreframeapp.com slash Dr. Drew. Use the code Dr. Drew for 25% off your first month or your annual subscription. That's at joinreframeapp.com slash Dr. Drew. Let's talk about our friends at Hydrolyte. I can't say enough about Hydrolyte. You hear me talk about them all the time. It gets me through workouts and medical procedures and colonoscopies and COVID. It absolutely contributed to my recovery from COVID. Hydration is key to feeling healthy, and there's never been a time when that could be more important. We're in the height of cold flu season. Every headache has got you testing for COVID. Staying hydrated can keep the questionable symptoms at bay, and there's nothing better than Hydrolyte to get it done. Taking their hydration formula one step further, now there is Hydrolyte Plus Immunity. It starts with their fast-absorbing electrolytes and adds a host of great ingredients. Plus, each single-serve, easy-pour drink mix contains 1,000 milligrams of vitamin C and 300 milligrams of elderberry extract. Hydrolyte Plus Immunity comes in convenient, easy-pour powder sticks that rapidly dissolve in water to make a great-tasting drink that is a 75% less sugar than your typical sports drink. It uses all-natural flavors. It's gluten-free, dairy-free, caffeine-free, non-GMO, and even vegan. Hydrolyte Plus Immunity is also now available in ready-to-drink bottles at the Walmart next to the pharmacy, or as always, you can find it by visiting hydrolyte.com slash Dr. Drew. That is H-Y-D-R-A-L-Y-T-E dot com slash Dr. Drew. 
And be sure to use that code DrDrew25 at checkout for a special discount. We are here with Dr. Vladimir Zelenko, and uh, we've been talking about the situation in the uh, Russian-Ukrainian uh, conflict. And uh, Reuters just reported something, I think, encouraging. Uh, Ukrainian forces, oh no, that wasn't what it was. It says Russians are falling back. But I, it said that Russia main goal is Donbass suggesting uh, scaled back ambitions, which is good, I hope. Uh, even though you know, I, I, it doesn't affect this construct you were, you were talking about. Did you want to finish that thought you had? And then Caleb, I'm going to have you ask your question as soon as Dr. Zanko finishes his thought. So I think, um, uh, the Russia Ukraine conflict in part was instigated, um, for several reasons, but one of them is to deflect attention from a, a failed attempt to uh, accomplish the agendas that I, I mentioned to you earlier, because instead of seven billion mm-hmm. people, they got three billion. People. Um, and so, um, there's going to be right now, by way of analogy, we're looking at two months before the end of World War II, the Nazis are scrambling, trying to hide, trying to create excuses and plausible deniability. We were just taking orders, whatever, blame others, because. Once uh, things settle down a little bit, there's going to be a, a lust for vengeance. And um, they're going to be, I don't know, if Nuremberg trials or Hague or military tribunals or whatever, but the Gelantes. But the, there's a group of people that are, uh, are really now scared for themselves because we know who they are I and mean, they were very vocal about it. And they created all this fear and all this chaos, obstructed life-saving medications, and really uh, did everything in their power to maximize carnage. So, so if I'm hearing you, if I'm cutting through the, you know, we've had a, you've given us a lot of information, a long story, but it sounds like here at the end, you're you're somewhat hopeful. You feel like the the people are oh, aware that there's okay. Oh, I'm and, and so that's like, I, think- I like to hear, yeah. Well, oh, I think we're on the verge of a wondrous uh, revelation of truth. The only variable here is the body count until we get there. Do you have a time frame for this? Oh, my God. Is it like we're on the verge that, of something good? Is it the fourth yeah, turning, as that one book suggests? I think, um, again, I'm going to speak now theologically. Uh, I mean, I think we're on the verge of a messianic transition um, where, as the prophet says, the knowledge of God will fill the world as the waters cover the seas. Um, The true narrative will come out. You know, I think God is giving every single individual the following choice. Because we have, as as a society, really have made some really bad choices for a long time. For example, this can be controversial, so what? Um, <laughs> we, that's well, nothing you've said so far that, is controversial, so. <laughs> we desecrated anything that has any type of sanctity, whether marriage, mm. gender, life itself, lo- the slaughtering of the unborn in an indiscriminate way. Um, we've normalized debauchery. Um, I recently read there was a transvestite dressed in drag, that came to read stories to children, six, six-year-olds. Now, listen, people can live with any way they want. I don't, I don't care. But uh, when you begin to impose that type of those choices on um, my children, when I have a different value structure, then that's when the problem begins with me. And so, in my opinion, this society has turned to, into what's analogous to Sodom and Gomorrah. We've normalized uh, immorality into the law of the land. It's a very convenient way of saying, God, we don't want you. We have our own uh, laws. But anyway, so I think that we're being given a choice. And here's the choice. And you can't sit this one out. You can't sit on the fence. And if you don't make a choice, you're making a choice anyway. You fall into camp. 
Who do you believe in? Who do you put your trust in? Who do you bow down to? You bow down to your creator who makes you every instant of time out of love? And do you ask him for the fortitude to deal with the uncertainty and uh, fears associated with living? Or do you let that fear uh, lead you astray into a cultish codependency on sociopathic oligarchs and corrupt government? That's it. That's the choice. Yeah, even just turning away from some of the um, the human deficiencies uh, is already sort of progress because the, the the certitude, the hubris. We were talking. I brought up humility a while ago to you. Uh, let me ask. Uh, well, Caleb, why don't you ask your question, Doctor Zlanko? Uh, yes. Um, so I I've read some stuff recently, and I don't know how much I believe it because I'm not a scientist, but I've read certain theories about something called graphene oxide being in the vaccines, that the goal is to use it and somehow to turn living humans into nodes for 5G and create a global mesh network. So is this connected to what you were talking about earlier, or have you seen any evidence of this in your research? Please, no. I mean, mean, that's what I've read, and it seemed like that connected to what you were saying earlier. So um, in the patent that I described about the tracking technology that's in these vaccines, it's, it's kind of related to that. Um, and it's not like the vaccines, they, they don't even have a power source themselves. It's not like they can transmit. But everyone carries a phone. Um, and I, I don't even know but how it's going to be done. But I could tell you the following. Historically, who was the uh, most powerful entity in the world? It was he who controlled the sea lanes? The sea lanes were the, the pathways for, for uh, basically energy. Uh, the word transmission or, or, or sending oil to one place to another to do business globally, internationally. And that's why the United States Navy is so big. It protects the sea lanes from pirates. Well, in the future, it, the next threshold is low orbit satellite networks, which we are actively now sending up. And it's a Skynet system. Right? And so he who controls the low orbit space really controls the future. Mm -hmm. Guess what President Trump formed under his presence? A new branch of the military, remember? Space Force, right. Know what it was called? Space Force. There's a reason why it was formed. Because there's now gonna be a power struggle for low orbit space to control this network. So obviously this network interrelates to some type of global interconnectivity and one world governance and a world, one world, communication system, and cryptocurrency. Right. How it works. Listen, 5G, everyone goes nuts. You know what 5G is? All it is is they use shorter wavelengths. And so you need an antenna, essentially every block. Whereas right. in the past, 4G systems, they used these big antennas. They would be maybe miles apart. They would triangulate. And so you kind of could know where someone was in the general vicinity. Now, with the 5G having antennas everywhere, you could, with razor precision, actually know where anyone is all the time, if they're connected to that. So I don't care about the 5G. It means nothing. But the fact is that they have now narrowed in and increased the resolution of being able to pinpoint uh, anything. Right. And so, I mean, I, I, I'm not a scientist. And so I don't, I don't actually fully believe that. I don't, I don't know if that's actually true. I just was wondering if that's connected to what you were saying earlier about this ultimate goal of interconnecting people onto this global cryptocurrency and being able to track them. Is that what you're, you're saying is that it's through something that they're secretly putting in people or. Right. So, you know how you, I don't know if you use ways. Yes. But ways tell you that you have 10,000 people next to you connected using it and they'll tell you where the police are everything is interconnected they know where you are you know where they are 
right? And that's all from an external device. But that technology is being scaled down um, onto very small levels and could literally be injected under the skin. Right. And so that's my... Right. The other part of the question, too, is that whenever I start going down this path and starting to ask these questions and wonder these things, it it starts to turn into a question in my mind of how many people would have to be in on this giant plan and also be keeping it secret. Like how many doctors, how many politicians, how many people in the military would have to be rolling this out, this very expensive plot? How many people would have to? They're not keeping it secret. They aren't keeping it secret. That's the thing. They're not they're not keeping it secret. The nature of evil is very interesting. They tell you, they brag about what they do. For example, Hitler wrote Mein Kampf for years before he took power. Right. You just have to learn how to listen well, that, and how to pay attention. Well, that's why, you know, I, I don't want to get into the, the details of what is and is not the case, but think more philosophically. And that's why what you were saying about Dostoevsky sort of interested me. I mean, it's. Uh, are you talking about the the grand the Grand Inquisitor, uh, Ivan's testimonial yes. from the Grand Inquisitor? Yeah. Yes. And and right. And essentially, what that is, if you, I, I, it's in the Brothers Karamazov, and I cannot recommend you read that strongly enough. Uh, you get you get a sense of how Russians think, for one thing. But but in there, in the middle of it, there is this huge um, exposition by one of the brothers uh, essentially telling a story where Jesus is imprisoned uh, and the Grand Inquisitor comes in and says, so, so you're the great Jesus Christ, you're nothing. And he goes on to have this philosophical discussion. What if you are actually that guy? I have you in prison right now. What are you going to do about it? So, sort of, And he really puts, he's, it's really an investigation and, and uh, Dr. Uh, Zelensky tell um, um Zelenko, sorry, I see why people make that mistake. It's 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 a it's a brain function, but uh, is really a, a story of moral relativism, right? Isn't that really what the story is about? Yeah, is there an absolute truth, or or is everything relative? Yeah. And if everything's relative, right. right, then what makes your value structure better than mine? You know what? Survival of the right. fittest. If my value structure allows me to uh, step on your head, then it's better. That's it. Uh, right. essentially that's, right. that's, you know, the, the Nazis killed 40 of my relatives, but who am I to say that was bad? I mean, I didn't like it. I don't like it, but if there's no absolute right or wrong, so they did it. They were able to do it and pull it up. And in their society, and, and think, the more you think. Yeah. And I think whether you, you know, whether you're a moral relativist or you, you know, whatever we think about virtue, uh, philosophy, I think we all prefer to live in a, a world that's as loud as it could possibly be. We we all prefer to live in the world that you're talking about. It just seems better, and we have uh, thousands of years of scripture that sort of suggests the human stories have been telling us that it's kind of better, and that uh, we really haven't figured it out all over again. And, uh, you know what? and it's, it, really it's much weird much to me simpler. that. Go ahead. It's really much more simpler than it's not complicated. Um, according to our scripture, I think everyone will agree we are all descendants of Noah and his family. <coughs> he had Adam, he populated the world. And then God got really pissed at them and he made a flood, cleaned, cleaned the house. And only Noah, his wife, three sons, and three daughter daughters were left. And from them issued all, out all of them. So in reality, we are all brothers and sisters descending from Noah and his family. The reason why I bring this up, that Noah was given seven laws, which are, in my opinion are relevant in every time and every place. And what are those laws? Well, they're very, they'll resonate in your ears because it's actually uh, common sense in many ways and some things that you probably grew up with. Number one, you should believe in one God. Number two, you shouldn't worship false gods. Those are the between you and God. Then three, four, and five are the following. Don't steal. Don't murder. Don't commit adultery. And that's logical because how can you have stable society <coughs> if you don't respect life, property, and uh, marital boundaries? 
Number six is to establish courts of justice that are interested in enforcing the rule of law. And number seven is the most interesting to me, uh, is not to eat of a limb of an animal while the animal is living. In other words, hmm. this is how it's explained, that everything was created for our use, but it doesn't mean you have to torture and abuse. You know how much right. pain you would incur animal cruelty, right? Yeah, if you yeah. bite into a living animal, yeah, right. why do that? Right. The way I interpret that is respect God's creation and his creature. Well, there's another, there's another layer to that from my perspective, which is don't be animalistic because that's what animals do. They eat each other raw, whatever, sure. live, Thank you, whatever. So, well, listen, let's uh, leave it with the injunctions to Noah. Uh, we really, uh, again, appreciate your spending time with us. Susan, anything before I let Dr. Zelenko go? Uh, uh, no, I'm good. Uh, we want to talk about a Z-stack. Oh, your, your, your supplement? Yes. Let's tell explain us, it. Tell us about that real quick. Sure. So um, I should send Cuomo flowers because when he obstructed <laughs> access to hydroxychloroquine, I told you I was forced to do more research, came up with quercetin. Um, the problem that I saw was that people had trouble putting the puzzle together. Two reasons. One, they couldn't source everything in the same place. Logistically became a problem. Number two, there's so many options for different C's, different D's, zincs. So it became uh, difficult for people to get the treatment protocol in the right time frame. So I was asked to put it all in one pill so that it's easier, accessible, and um, people could have it in the right time frame. That's key. So that's how Z-Stack was born. It's basically quercetin, vitamin C, uh, zinc, and vitamin D. And, and what I recommend dosing. And according to the FDA, all I'm allowed to say is that it's a nutritional supplement and immune booster. But its ingredients are all peer reviewed uh, papers on the NIH server show the following that quercetin and vitamin C together as a zinc ionophore, zinc delivery system, zinc inhibits RNA dependent RNA polymerase, which is essential for viral RNA viral replication, and vitamin D3, high normal levels of vitamin D3. Uh, boost the immune system to such a way that um, it virtually eliminates intensive care unit addiction. Well, and how do people go about it if they're interested in getting that? I think um, I can I, tell I, you I, that. I, <laughs> there is, uh, Here, let me tell you. Dr. Drew.com. You can go to Dr. Dr. I said. Yeah, use do yeah, go and use the code Dr. Drew for a discount. So All it's right. Dr. Drew.com Z stack. There you go. And you can avoid having to take all those pills that you don't like taking every day. I, I like the idea. It's all, is it all in one pill? It is. By the way, I open source all this information. I didn't um, patent it. It's, it's not proprietary. Anyone can reproduce it. Um, I felt it was so important that the information was sent out to the world. But there was a need for convenience and for accessibility. Logistics, so I, I decided to uh, fill that need. But anyone could put it together by their own, by themselves. The ingredients and the dosing is right on the bottle. In the meantime, we will put you in our prayers that uh, that the quiet PET scan is reflective of that tumor going away, uh, and that we wish you good health. Uh, and this man has a will to live. Yeah, let me tell you, and that you have. I less think it's the Ukrainian in you. Yeah, she's been around my family, which is also Ukrainian, which we've all had a similar, <laughs> we have a similar relationship with our health, our body, and our medical problems. Drew's father, yeah. and I mean, it was just amazing how he, he got through things. So I, I think you have Stubborn. longevity. Stubborn. Yep, exactly. That's for sure. <laughs> all right, my friend. Well, thank you again. And, God bless uh, you. Anything you want to uh, push out before I let you go? No, it's, it's nice to see you just on a personal level. It's nice to connect you as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. God bless you. Vladimir Zelenko, everybody, and we will just leave it at that. Thank you all for being here. And I'll be back on Monday, I believe. Uh, is that correct? At uh, 3 o'clock with mm -hmm. uh, Greg Grunberg, if you saw him in one of the Star Wars films. 
a uh, friend of ours, and uh, he has some interesting new stuff going on, so we're going to push that out. And then Jason Waller on uh, Tuesday, is that mm -hmm. right? And then Naomi Wolf on Thursday. Thursday. And Evie, I think, is on... Evie uh, might be on Tuesday. I've got a urologist coming in here. Maybe I can... No, yeah. I think Evie's getting this slot. All right, fair enough. All right, everybody, we'll see you on Monday at 3 o'clock. So I remember seeing somewhere where they said that the shape of the penis is actually also kind of like like a scooper. It's almost like your penis going in and out is also kind of sucking out all the jizz out of her so that your jizz could go in. Yeah, and you, I think you probably heard something but twisted it. Uh, so I dreamed. This. You may have turned the, the what you heard into a dream or something. But why but would there, I? There's dream a about lot of weird. <laughs> there's a lot of. <laughs>Ask Dr. Drew is produced by Caleb Nation and Susan Pinsky. As a reminder, the discussions here are not a substitute for medical care, diagnosis, or treatment. This show is intended for educational and informational purposes only. I am a licensed physician, but I am not a replacement for your personal doctor, and I am not practicing medicine here. Always remember that our understanding of medicine and science is constantly evolving. Though my opinion is based on the information that is available to me today, some of the contents of this show could be outdated in the future. Be sure to check with trusted resources in case any of the information has been updated since this was published. If you or someone you know is in immediate danger, don't call me, call 911. If you're feeling hopeless or suicidal, call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 800 800- 273-8255. You can find more of my recommended organizations and helpful resources at drdrew.com slash help.